a good warm welcome this morning to everyone. Um, today's Boardroom Bites at nine is on how can I meaningfully contribute to board decision making. And today we've got two wonderful presenters, Barry Jack and Jonathan Renz. Barry is a chartered accountant and a chartered director of South Africa. He's a non-executive director and a co-founder of Catanoa. And Jonathan has got a variety of experiences from the property space to IT and solar. And Jonathan's also co-founder of Catanoa. So Barry and Jonathan, I'm gonna hand over to you and look forward to hearing more about um, the presentation this morning. Morning, thank you, Vicky, and welcome to everybody. It's good to see such a large turnout, so thank you. Um, just very briefly, uh, Katanoa is, Jonathan and I have been working for, Jono, it'd be about four or five years now on, on, a, on something that Jonathan developed. Um, and so we've reached a point, uh, we are talking to a number of companies who want to use it, um, but at this stage, it's still early, although we've been working on it for a long time. So. Um, just to give you that background, and really the byline I was going to use for this was uh, how decisions can be made in the light of trust-based integrated thinking uh, with the emphasis on trust. So we will look in the, the, the main title, uh, contributing to board making deci uh, decision making, uh, we're going to look at it through the lens of Katanoa as we've developed it. We'll break this into three sessions, um, followed by a Q&A. The challenges of being a director and the need for reliable information. I'll then pass over to Jonathan, who's going to be looking at uh, trust-based integrated thinking and how that's used in decision-making. And then I'll go on to trust-based thinking from a point of view of why trust is so important. It may seem obvious, but it's not obvious. If you look around the world right now, you'll see that there's not an awful lot of trust. So Vicky, if we could then put up slide two, please. Thank you. So those of you who haven't seen the series on Chernobyl, I would suggest that you look at it. I think it's on Showmax, uh, certainly it's on Netflix. So the truth doesn't care about our needs or wants. It doesn't care about our governments, our ideologies and our religions, and it will lie and wait for all time. And this at last is the gift to Chernobyl. In other words, Chernobyl teaches that lying and not telling the truth right from the beginning has its price to pay. And one needs to deal with it because trust doesn't take, doesn't respect anybody unless they are trustworthy and that their ethics includes that integrity. So the rest of our discussion that follows is in the context of this statement. So, so let this idea rest in your mind as we go through this journey today. I imagine all of us are directors, either executive or non-executive. i have in the uh, role of non-executive and have been on a number of boards in that role as independent non-executive. As such, whether we're executive or non-executive, we're all bound to act with due care, skill and diligence, and that all our decisions must be made in the interests of the company. That's Companies Act, that's King. So again, perhaps like me, if you've ever been concerned about how I go about meaningfully and positively contributing to decision-making as a member of the governing body, which of course includes the board and board committees, and I'll, I'll use that phrase, governing body. So how can we make a meaningful contribution without frankly just being, excuse the phrase, a pain in the ass? Bearing in mind that as non-executive directors, we don't get access to the corridor talk or the, the, the over coffee meetings uh, where information is changed in a, in a less formal way. We attend four, maybe more meetings uh, depending on whether we're on committees, there may be more. Um, and then we get a pack. And sometimes that pack is pretty large and sometimes it comes in time, sometimes it comes a bit too close to the meeting, but we need, we need to pour through it. So we're armed with the information that is given to us as a starting point. The way the phrase I always look is that we look into the workings of the company through a window. We're not there rubbing shoulders. So we're not part of the daily interactions. 
as a member of the governing body, what I need to know and to be properly informed and fulfill my fiduciary duty. So what is it that I need in the pack? What, what sort of information do I need? And as a non-exec, one of the things that has troubled me, and, and I, I, I was just looking through some of the participants and there are a couple of uh, current and former uh, colleagues on boards listening. What do I ask to make a meaningful contribution really without holding things up? And do I add value at the meetings? Given that trust is earned over time. Now, there's a celebrated case, which is uh, we know about. It's an international South African company with international links and so on and investments. And I heard the chairman uh, being asked on the radio, how come you simply didn't pick up what the, the chief executive was doing. And his remarks were really quite informative. And he said, you must understand I trusted him. Now, King, uh, the King Code calls for independent non-executive directors and the balance of the board as is appropriate. You cannot go onto a board, any board, just trusting that everything is going to be fine, that you're going to be told the truth, that there'll be no problems in that regard because trust is earned over time. We know that in our personal capacities. So do we just automatically trust because we've been invited onto a board? Do we trust the executive and management team? And the answer there is no. It doesn't mean to say that you're adversarial. So when they're looking at a decision, how did they come to that recommendation to us to make a decision or to approve a decision as the governing body? What evidence or facts did they consider? And, and were there any estimates or uh, assumptions that they made to put the recommendation, put the problem to, or the decision to put before us? What are the considerations that support their recommendations to the governing body? Why do they think this is a good idea? Did they consider their interests and impact on all stakeholders, which of course goes and includes the six capitals and maybe goes beyond. Do they in fact have any idea of what information I as a non-executive need? So there's a two-way education program going on there. Vicky, could we have slide three, please? Okay, so this you can find in the integrated, uh, the IIR framework. Integrated thinking is active consideration. Now that's interesting, that phrase, because if you look at the Greek for katana, essentially it means seriously consider. So is the act of consideration by an organization of the relationships between its various operating uh, and functions and the capitals that the organization uses or affects? I'm just going to move this because I can't see the whole slide. So just get rid of me. Okay. Um, Integrated thinking leads to integrated decision-making actions that consider the creation of value over the short, medium, and long-term. So that's from the framework. Since this is us now, since to be integrated means to have integrity or to be whole, it is not surprising that organizations struggle with integrity given the vagueness that exists around what integrated thinking practically looks like. The framework is, is excellent, it sets out, it's under constant revision, of course, um, but how do we go about acting on it and actually doing things? There's, the, there's no prescription there and no guidance in that sense. What does the King Four say? In the forward to King Ford, it says, King Ford, it says the reality is that the, organized, that the resources and capitals used by organizations constantly interconnect and interrelate. The organization's reporting should reflect this interconnectedness and indicate how its activities affect and are affected by the six capital that uses in the triple context which it, in which it operates. So I would ask, I ask myself and perhaps ask you, how often have you challenged executive and management as to how they've actually gone about fulfilling this reporting requirement? And how have they gone about gathering the necessary information and assurance to be satisfied that the impacts and outcomes on all stakeholders, 
including the six capitals, is acceptable and would generate or retain trust. Furthermore, principle 16 of King Code states in the execution of its governance role and responsibilities, the governing body should adopt a stakeholder inclusive approach that balances the needs, interests and expectations of material stakeholders in the best interests of the organization over time. Now there's a key question that the seminar seeks to address. So as a non-executive, what do I ask? What do I expect of executive and management to assure myself that I can perform properly, diligently, uh, and that I can interrogate the reliability, the appropriateness, the impact and the expected outcome of the decisions I'm being asked to approve to all shareholders? Or more appropriately, how do I address all the relevant issues in the moment of decision making? Not at the end of the year when we might prepare our report and our, our in, integrated report, or even what we're going to say about our governance. How do we address all the relevant issues in the moment of decision making? And this is where I, and where I joined forces with Jonathan and Katanoa. This, of course, requires integrated thinking. It's essential in, in, moment, in the moment decision making. So, thinking of the Catano integrated decision considerations, uh, Vicky, could we have slide four, please? Okay. This is essentially shows you the Catano integrated thinking uh, considerations, and there is a scorecard and chart. So obviously there's a vent or a recommendation being put to the governing body, the proposed decision. In the terms of using the Catena integrated to considerations, all the assumptions should be recorded. We then can identify the considerations impacted and align that to the vision and mission of the, and strategy, which would incorporate obviously values. And then we access and assess the impacts of that decision potentially on stakeholders. Now, where any part of those decisions and any one of those stakeholders shows up as to be negatively impacted for one reason or another, it goes back through the cycle again, such that fairness to that situation is achieved. If that happens, the chances are that trust will be retained or even earned if it's a newish business and ultimately it would come to the final decision. So thinking of some of the conversations you have had over the months or years sitting on a governing body, have any of them when you've asked these questions simply taken you down a rabbit hole and not really addressed the issue? So how does one ensure that the considerations are taken into account, that all the considerations are taken into account when reviewing or considering any meaningful decision? Are there any tools available? At director, executive and management levels, as complexity grows, as businesses develop, managing decisions needs more than practice. It needs a trust-based, integrated thinking and decision-making methodology. And this is what we seek to present. I have, over the years, certainly felt the need for a structure to address this complexity, particularly as shareholder inclusive, stakeholder inclusiveness has become center stage. And many of you would know that the debate going on in the United States, particularly about stakeholderism, shareholderism, and, and so on, and the balance between shareholders and stakeholders, as if, they, the shareholders were not stakeholders as well, is, is a meaningful debate, which is quite disturbing in some aspects. These concerns resulted in extensive discussions I had with Jonathan uh, over the development and the further development of the Catano so solutions, based largely on his uh, boardroom experiences and to which I added my own. He's had many years experience in the boardroom. He, together with a colleague, founded a small property company years ago, which they successfully built up, listed, and ultimately was acquired by 
probably the country's major property group. So it's at this stage then, I would like to hand over to Jonathan. Jonathan, over to you. Hi, everybody. Yeah, I, th I think for me, the, um, the, the whole idea of um, for building a decision-making framework um, of integrated thinking. Um, um, Vimy, if you can just take the next slide, please. Um, arises from what I call the, like a bit of a, a disconnect that I see and that I practically saw. I'm not a theory guy in terms of most things. I'm more of a practical guy. I'm an ops guy. I make things happen. It's kind of really um, where I come from in this and so quite different um, to, to, to many of those who operate in this space. Uh, so for me, when I think of inter integrated thinking, you know, if you look at the definition as uh, barriers are really um, uh, read out according to integrated reporting, according to King. Um, if you were to go and ask the average person uh, about what that actually means practically, what does it actually look like on the ground in the day? It's actually quite theoretical and it doesn't really, it doesn't, it doesn't create a practical outcome. And what's interesting to me is that you have integrated thinking that's called for, which I totally agree and the definition is not something I have a problem with. Uh, I, I think it's a bit vague, but I, I like the concept. Um, and, and you have this huge big disconnect, a massive disconnect, because the next thing you hit is you call integrated report and you integrated reporting. And the question for me is, well, how do I get from integrated thinking to integrated reporting and where does that um, process lie? How, what does it look like? And how does it impact those of us who are sitting in boards trying to make a meaningful contribution to those to the decisions that are made? How, you know, how do I make decisions that are in line with the integrated thinking of the company? Uh, Vimy, maybe the next slide, please. Vimy, thank you. So if you look at this, this little um, process, because of cause and effect, you know, if, if, if everything has got a cause. Um, so integrated thinking, in a sense, is something that will uh, drive and empower integrated decisions. If you think about that just for a moment, it makes complete sense. The way you think will drive the way you decide how to do things. The way an organization thinks will drive the decisions that it makes. Uh, if you think of it in another little way, very practically put, uh, every organization is the sum of all its decisions. That's really what it is. It's, uh, we make decisions and there's thinking that drives it. So again, I came to this idea is if I'm able to take integrated thinking and give it a bit of structure, give it a bit of, not too much, but just enough, then maybe when I come to contribute to those decisions, if I contribute with that thinking in my mind, if you think of it as a lens, then Katana would be a lens, a way of looking through um, uh, the decision-making process because the way we think drives the way we, de the, we the, the decisions we make. And of course, then what happens is if you've got an organization where the decisions are consistent uh, with the integrated thinking, I've got integrated thinking and that starts to build in and create integrated decisions. Well, then you start to drive integrated culture um and of course if you then get an integrated culture well that automatically produces the outcomes that they are desired and everyone wants uh highlighted in, in the integrated report so from a cat no perspective uh we, we've got the thing called catacrino cat no trust-based integrated thinking uh so we say let's take integrated thinking and let's just blow it up a little bit let's give it a bit of language give it a bit of terms give it a bit of structure um, so that, that every organization can principally uh, understand how to, to think. And once I know how to think, well, now I'm sitting in a boardroom table and well, we've agreed how we're going to think. We know how we're going to think. We've agreed what the considerations are uh, that should drive what's important and how, we, how the whole thing relates. Well, then it becomes a little bit easier to actually make decisions because the decisions then are made and they're made around what we call the Katana Promise, the Framework and Scorecard. So the, the, the promise framework and scorecard are things that kind of arise from the thinking that has been uh, given a bit more structure. And of course, this then starts to impact down into the very culture of the organization um, because um, that's, it just happens naturally. <laughs> you know, cause and effect, it happens naturally. If I think a certain way, you know, how many, I don't know, if you think about the organizations that you're part of, um, Every organization thinks in a certain way. We talk about, uh, I wonder how that company will think about this. We actually use that expression. Uh, I find that tremendously interesting expression because that company could be thousands of people, but yet they have an ethos. They have a, a way of approaching, a way of thinking. And what Catanoa does is it provides a framework into which every organization can then inject its own 
um, culture, its own um, value structure, its own way of doing things into uh, the vocabulary the framework. And then the, the framework then becomes a basis for decision making. And that's really the idea. So if you, if you look at the process, the integrated process, we're kind of filling the gap, the in the moment gap. Because if you just take integrated thinking and it's undefined, well, you know, when you come to do the integrated reporting, I don't know if those of you have done integrated reporting, but when you actually do the integrated report, um, it's normally done after the event. It's always done, um, if you think of the year end, you finish your year end, then you go and do the accounts, which are important, then you start doing the integrated reporting. And now you're up to 15 months away from what actually happened in, in that actual year that you're reporting on. And so to me, the thing is, if you're looking for integrated thinking to actually have an effect, it's got to have an effect in the moment throughout the organization. And you can't, it can't do that unless it's within the integrated, the, the thinking actually pushes itself into the organization through the decision-making processes of everybody, not just those at board, but everybody into the culture, into the report. So this is the idea that we're, we're investigating, this idea that we're trying to um, um, implement through Katanoa. Um, I think if you want to go to the next slide. So this is what you see in front of you here is the is the essence of the um, of, of the Catano thinking model, how we look at it. Um, you'll see that um, uh, I don't know, you, you, in the center, you've got um, impact on trustworthy fairness. Uh, trustworthiness is, is kind of like a, it's it's the thing that sits in the middle. And the questions that we ask is we ask is how does the, 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 the proposed decision, imagine you have a decision. So you, you have a decision, you're sitting around the table, you want to talk about a decision X, whatever X happens to be. And you say, well, okay, what is the impact of the proposed recommendation of decision? Because every decision that needs to become is, is a recommendation. There's a series of events, a decision is required, and there's a recommendation. And the question then is simply this, and this is the question that drives Catanoa is, what is the impact of the proposal on? And the word on is all the different, um, all the different considerations, all the things that that decision could impact. And the question is, what is the impact of that proposed decision on? And so we say, well, on what? Okay. And the, so you, if you have a look at it, you've got three, um, th 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 three categories. The, the, the first category at the top is the impact on external stakeholders in society. So when you make a decision, there is the potential that that decision will impact and the trustworthiness of the company in respect of the, the, the external stakeholders in society. Those, and by the external stakeholders in society, what we're really talking about is those things that sit outside the company. Okay. Uh, if you look to the right of the, of the slide, you see that will include things like nature, there's your environmental um, issues that come is society stakeholders and direct stakeholders. So society stakeholders will be things, people that are not necessarily directly connected to the company, but yet which uh, in the sense of contractually, but yet they are impacted by the company. And direct stakeholders will be those that are directly impacted from the company. So there might be supply chain, it might be um, providers of debt, there are all sorts of um, um, where, uh, where, we, where we take this and define a little bit further. The second category of um, is at the bottom. If you go bottom left, and left is the impact of the trustworthiness and the fairness on the proper functioning of the of the company and the organization. When you think about it, the company is itself a functioning unit. It's got to function properly. It's got to be sustainable. It's got to maintain um, a, a, its output. It's got to keep going. It's it's got its own uh, life in in terms of itself. And and you can make a decision. The question is, what is the impact of that? And and some of the capital sits in there. So you've got the sort of financial capital sits in that one. You've got manufacturing capital sits in that one. There are all sorts of um, kind of um, little subcategories of that. Um, so we've got three three big. Um, Headline numbers, the expansiveness, which every company needs to grow. What's the impact on growth? What's the impact on sustainability? And what's the impact on the aesthetic? And the final one is on the, on the right-hand side of the bottom is what is the impact of trustworthiness on the internal stakeholders and team? And this is really the people side of the business. And that might be the individual human resources. It'd be your financial stakeholders. You think about it, financial stakeholders, those provide capital, provide human, ca I can provide human capital, or I can provide financial capital, They're providing capital into the business. 
And then, of course, lastly, you've got everyone acting as a team. So the whole idea here is that when you approach decision making, you look at uh, this holistically from, um, from the perspective of saying, how does this decision impact the various output parts of the company, the various things that the company is going to um, uh, interact with and, 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 and be touched and, be, and touch and be touched by. And that's really the question. So, so Catano framework is about setting up the framework, identifying all the considerations, and then asking a simple question. So when you so when you end the decision making, let's come back to the title. And the title of this um, of this um, this talk today is really about and how do we make how do we contribute better? Well, the way we contribute is by making sure that the decisions we make don't have unnecessary bad outcomes. There's this lovely program on TV called What Were You Thinking? It's, uh, it's kind of those, you know, those kind of TV programs where everyone films guys and making idiots of themselves or using skateboards and flying into um, uh, accidents and hitting themselves and becoming quite stupid. And then the question is, what were you thinking? You know, and I sense, in a sense when you think of a board, what you're trying to do is, you, is, is, is we're trying to think and make sure that the decisions that we make are such that we don't end up on the program, what were you thinking? You know, you make a decision and three years later, the guy says, what were you thinking? And there comes the point, what were you thinking? And Katano is saying, let's go back to this idea of thinking. Let's go back, let's take integrated thinking. Let's give it a bit more flavor structure so that when the decisions come up, when we're sitting around the table, we could say to everyone, guys, what's the outcome of this? What's the impact of this? on all the considerations on all those things that are going to impact this company going forward because we're there to make a decision in the best interest of the company uh, and having a method brings it this, a little bit of discipline at the time of the decision making and gives us um, a, a way that we can then question and, and ensure that the decisions that we make have a better chance of um, standing the test of time so there's in, in simple the idea and I'll give you back to 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 uh, to Barry Barry you're on mute sorry I'm on mute thanks Jono um, so this this side then obviously as as Jono said is it's it, it links the three factors in a sense integrated thinking values decision making process with Catano at the center. That's how we certainly see it. I'd like to now address the issue of trust a little bit more directly, perhaps. And I draw on uh, what I've often heard uh, Professor Mervyn King say, that a company is an incapacitated legal construct that only gets its character, personality, and purpose from those who direct, lead, manage, and work in it. It's, it has no personality. The personality that it eventually demonstrates is that of the people. I want to stress the importance of making decisions that result in trustworthy outcomes to all concerned stakeholders, which of course includes the shareholders. Given that every organization is ultimately the sum of all its decisions, it surely makes sense that those decisions should be trustworthy that I, as, as somebody who's living near a, a plant, may have nothing to do with that as a supplier or customer or, or, or uh, uh, even an employee, can trust that that company is not going to damage my lifestyle, my health, and so on by its products and its manufacturing processes. So Catano Trust-Based Integrated Thinking is predicated entirely on trust which is the heartbeat of an organization because in our view, trust is primary and all else is secondary. If we conduct our lives and businesses conduct their, their operations in such a way that they lose trust. Now in the last three or four years, we have seen, and of course it's been heavily covered in the press and widely covered in the press, where businesses lose the trust, not only of society, but of regulators, of uh, clients, customers, it's very difficult for them to come back up. They can lose their reputation overnight. What does this mean then? 
in terms of management. It means that trust is critical. It's an integral part of risk management. Uh, why, why is trust so important? Well, if you look at your personal situation, if you're like me, um, I want to be trusted. I want to behave in such a way that I, I engender trust, that I am reliable and consistently reliable because I need people's trust. Organizations need their customers and society's trust in order to establish sustainable business relationships. And because deep down, we all want to be trusted. And Jonathan's trust answered the question of trusted by whom. It's, it's all of those around, around the business table, so to speak. Can we just have, please, Vicky, uh, slide nine? Okay. Think beyond feelings at decision time. So the, what do you want to think about when you're making your decisions? And this is maybe a little simplistic, but it really covers it. How does this decision, be it an investment, uh, an expansion of the plant, a disposal, whatever it might be. And just to pause a second before I carry on there, ideally, Catano thinking and Catano solutions and the integrated think, trust-based integrated thinking, ideally it starts with the strategic plan. When one is putting together management and the board are putting together the strategic plan, if you filter it through the lens of Catano thinking, and how is the way we're going to conduct our business in the next three to five years? What's the impact it's going to have on society and all the other stakeholders? What are the outcomes going to be? Short, medium, and long-term. Then as we go through the year and fulfill all the, the strategic planning horizon, we can see how the actual decisions are also filtered through the lens. So how does this impact the functioning of the organization? Is there trust by staff of their immediate superiors, of the board, of those in authority? Because if you don't have that trust, let's face it, you, if, if your role, role in a business as a senior executive is based on the power of your position, not because people want to follow you because they trust you, it's fairly shallow and probably not sustainable. What about external society as stakeholders? There's no question, when you form a company, you get a piece of paper from SIPSI that you've now, you're legally able to trade. But who gives you the license to operate? Society is licensed to operate. Because if society doesn't trust you, when I say you, I mean the organization, well, it's not going to get off to a good start. And then what about the internal team and stakeholders? What about those sorts of folks? Do I trust my colleagues? Do I trust my subordinates? Do I trust the non-executive directors and do they trust me? And there was a question uh, that I saw come up a little while ago, which I've typed to reply to. How, how does an executive uh, build trust with the board? Well, it's by behavior, being open and transparent and consistently honest. And over time, that will develop a relationship of trust. Of course, it needs to continually being looked at and considered. So that leads to trustworthy fairness. If you're behaving properly in all of these sections, that using trustworthy fairness. So if there's a decision I'm going to make and it's, it's okay for the staff, it's okay for the regulators and so on, their stakeholders, but there's an area, let's just say the environment, we're going to be doing some mining of some sort and it's going to damage the environment potentially. That would be scored red rather than green. So now what do I do about it? Because that may have a significant impact on our trustworthiness. If we then say and deliver and budget for reconstituting that area where we're going to mine and we behave fairly to the environment and we behave fairly to the people who live around and maybe are dependent on that environment, then maybe trust will be retained and maybe even enhanced. So um, it's important to understand, as I mentioned earlier, that trust is all about risk. And I, I wonder how many um, risk heat maps have trust, retention of trust, retaining trust as a potential risk 
it's trust is not a subset of ethics. It's the key component of organizational risk. So what about values and culture? The link between values and trusts exists not in the idea of values themselves, but rather in the expected and desired outcome from the rigorous implementation of those values in the moment of decision. Because the organizational culture really is determined by this is the way we do things here. That's our culture driven by our values, our vision and our mission. It's how we do things here. It's how we behave here. So expanding the core considerations, the core considerations of the Katano framework essentially provide three headings, which Jonathan's looked at under which each have a set of expanded considerations for the organization and which it needs to take into account. So can we have uh, the next slide? I think it's 10, Vicky, thank Thanks, Vicky. So Katano establishes a simple and natural scorecard to quote what needs, uh, to guide what needs to be considered and that fairness of each of the proposed decision is subjected to and interrogated and seen through the lens of being trustworthy. Core to Catano's intervention is trustworthy fairness because in the life of the organization, as I mentioned earlier, trust is primary and all else is secondary. And fairness de-risks the breakdown of trust and the loss of trust is very difficult to come back from. And you just have to look at some of the organizations that are in the process of rebuilding trust in the marketplace and beginning to get clients back and that sort of thing. It's, it's a very difficult, painful and long and costly process. Better to retain trust and behave fairly. The integrated uh, reporting council in its IR framework defines integrated thinking as the active consideration by an organization of the relationships between its various operating and functional units and the capitals, all the stakeholders that the organization uses or affects. Integrated thinking leads to integrated decision-making and actions that consider the creation of value over the short, medium, and long-term. So taking that, and there's more in, in if you go and have a look at the, at the report, so taking that and applying it in terms of your decision-making processes, such as the Catano framework, it does help. So it's a trust-based integrated thinking methodology where each consideration on the scorecard has an outcome that is measured against the assumptions connected to the proposed decision and their impact on trust and fairness. Slide 11, please, Vicky. Okay, so why a decision-making framework? What, what is necessary? Surely we've all been making decisions from time to time. We make decisions in our personal capacity in, in, within families, uh, within businesses and so on. So wh wh why do we need this framework? Well, first of all, it's a tool to manage trust related to risk in the organization. It places trust and values into the moment of decision helps us to establish and maintain trust-based culture in the organization. By the way, let me just go back to that second point there, places trust and values in the moment of decision. If one has taken good care, been, you know, due care, skill and diligence, thought things through, applied all the assumptions, it doesn't mean to say that mistakes will never be made. For example, one might consider uh, one of the boards I sat on had three hotels, and I guess I'm just trying to think of what year it was at the beginning of 20, uh, end of 2017 when we were finalizing the strategy for 2018, 2019, 2020. We took a view that uh, all would, in terms of what our resources were, would be consistent with the past. We made the dis mistake of not being aware of what the lack of water and rain would mean on that business and it was costly. Now that was not negligence, it was this that it was something that caught us from left field. It could be that you take a view 
and predicate your, your business decisions on, an, on a, an exchange rate of such and such to the dollar or the euro. And maybe that is not the way the thing goes, beneficially or not. So it helps to establish and maintain trust-based culture in the organization. If any, everybody in the business understands the need to be trustworthy, and we do have a thing called the Catano uh, Trust Promise. So now what about decision time? It improves the quality of decisions by highlighting risks, assumptions, by providing discipline uh, at decision time with a practical scorecard. It increases decision predictability and assist mobility succession in the organization. It grows leadership competency, decision-making capacity, and confidence. Um, just turning on. Uh, and what about corporate governance? Well, it avoids false shareholder versus stakeholder dilemma because it considers all stakeholders. It helps non-executives consider, review, and provide better inputs into decisions. Decisions. It provides a comprehensive, integrated thinking methodology that runs throughout the organization's decision-making culture and ultimately the integrated report. So that's pretty much, um, Vicky, where um, I think we've come to. Um, some final thoughts then, if I may, before we go to Q&A. Um, the purpose of this discussion was to consider how as a non-executive director, can I be sure to have touched all the bases in satisfying my stewardship role to shareholders and the public interest, that staff, management, executive and directors have considered all the appropriate issues to fully take account of the impact and expected outcome of, on all stakeholders of a particular decision at the moment of decision making that I have reviewed and interrogated all the explanations and assumptions recorded in the Catano scorecard considerations. And obviously that would be a discussion. Receive the necessary explanations how the organization will manage any negative outcomes to mitigate the risk of trust downgrades such that fairness is assured and trust retained. So I don't know if Jonathan wants to add to that. But that brings us to the end of the formal side. So we can go, Vicky, to Q&A. Thank you, Barry. Um, just a reminder to anyone that's on this morning, if you'd like to ask a question live, um, please raise your hand and I'll assist the enable talk functionality. So you can, you can also ask your questions live. Um, Barry and Jonathan, um, so far, what's in the Q&A? We've got a, um, I see, okay, I see that. Question has gone. Um, there was a question from Berenice and, and Malcolm, but it says it was answered. Um, there's a question from Leslie. Um, thanks for sharing your, your ideas. Um, I like your thinking, but I'm a little concerned that this may be additional red tape and an added burden on management and the board. What is your thinking on this? Yeah, uh, uh, John, I, I can go ahead and then you can add to it if you like. Um, yeah, that's cool. You, you, you go along. Uh, yeah, 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 just say, uh, <laughs> there, there is uh, the whole of this whole thing was designed to try and reduce it, but let's see, how, let's see how Barry answers the question and we'll fill in. You're right, though. If every decision has has some thinking that's go that goes behind it, and if I think of the board packs as it happens, literally, then you and I have plowed through. Um, and, and other boards that I've sat on, there is an awful lot of work that goes into those board packs. Now, if one, we haven't, we're not going to show the scorecard and so on here, but obviously the scorecard, which is a one pager, uh, has, has supporting working documents, which uh, provide the reasoning behind the assumptions and the considerations. Hopefully, management would have thought about those things in any event and, and recorded them. So it's really not additional work, it's the lens through which we want to look at. So it gives us a consistency uh, in terms of the approach to decision-making. Jono? Yeah, I think that's exactly that. I mean, if, 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 you, if, if I write a report, I, most of my time on board was from an exec side. So when I recommend a decision, I've got to motivate it. And motivating it must give you a sense of, well, why, why is this a good decision? And when I say, why is it a good decision? Well, 
um, I've got to answer the good the, the questions and I've got to give the assumptions um, that I'm making. So all, all Katana does is give a framework into which each, um, so it gives a framework um, into which the, the recommendation is then plugged into. So you, I'm forced into say, well, okay, I've thought of all the points. There, I think there are 27 in total. Uh, you know, yes, no, do they impact? Uh, if so, yes, uh, and is it good or bad? So it doesn't actually add, it, it doesn't add if I'm doing my job properly. When it comes to actual board discussions, it actually makes it simpler because we've, we know all the questions we need to ask. We know the areas of trust where we're exposed. We know the risk that we're trying to manage. Um, uh, we have a set methodology, so that actually uh, speeds things up a little bit. And effectively, we can then talk around the outcomes, the outcomes of the decision um, in respect of uh, the various considerations and, 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 and how they've been dealt with in the actual motivation of the decision. So I would argue that actually it doesn't add any, 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 any red tape, actually. It doesn't actually add any red tape. What it does, it just gives a structure um, to create a sense of consistency in the decision-making process. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for that. Somebody's raised a hand. Vicky, do you know what to do with that? Uh, it's it's gone now, so there isn't a, a hand raised anymore. Okay. Um, so a next question uh, from Regina. Would you agree trust is acting with absolute honesty in the best interest of the company? Um, and I guess that also ties up with the previous question that was there, which you answered, I think, um, uh, via typing in a response, Barry, which was how can executives build trust with the board? So maybe you want to just answer that live for, for everyone to, to hear. Yeah. Uh, it, it, trust is, uh, I think if, if we look at uh, Eugene's comment, to, he, he, one of the things he says is that trust, we know that trust and a trust culture is a, is a very fragile thing and it needs to be constantly reinforced. So it's constant behavior. Um, you know, where we, we don't let ourselves and others down by, by making decisions or behaving in a manner that is not trustworthy. It's, it needs to be embedded in the organization. And if it does embed in the organization, and as I say, we, we do have a number of uh, tools that we use in that regard, but it is an ongoing thing. One can't at ever any time take it for, for granted. So really it's a question, and if I just think uh, of, of just, just take Jonathan and myself to bring it into a microcosm. We've been working together for what, four plus years, Jono. And that doesn't mean to say that we, we never disagree with some issue that, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a Catanoa book and there are times when, uh, and it's Jonathan's the author. Um, and I've, if you like, edited it and I'm not the only one. But there are times where I said, I'm having a difficulty with this paragraph. Uh, I, I don't necessarily agree with it. And then we're open and transparent with each other as to why we want to say that and what the basis is. And in the end, we come up not with a necessarily, sometimes it might be a compromise, but not in the book, with what, what supports trust. So in a sense, it's a behavioral issue. And if somebody is behaving in a non-trustworthy basis, one has to think about how one is going to deal with that. And if you're on the board and, and you're someone who is not being trustworthy, frankly, the rest have to call them out. We know this about the delinquent director and that's, that sort of stuff. And uh, I think it's PwC have written the paper on from the uh, CG and the Corporate Governance Network on delinquent directors. But again, it's a question of do we want to behave consistently, transparently, and honestly? Do we have integrity? And do we live our lives that way? And it's by demonstration. How do I know that somebody is trustworthy when I first meet them? I don't. I might like the look of their eyes or the way they stand or their posture or the way they look. But I have, they have to earn that trust in the relationship over a period of time. I may decide to to trust them immediately because I have a, se a sense or a feeling, but that's not what we're talking about here. We need to think the things through. So trust is fragile and it needs to constantly be viewed. 
Jonah? Yeah, I, th I think to me, the problem with trust is that we, when you make decisions, you often are forced, you have these dilemmas where, practically speaking, between a rock and a hard place, and, and it's not always easy. Um, we, we put up the, the whole Chernobyl thing about truth, um, you know, every, and I think we, we, I'm not trying to, in this whole discussion, make things simpler. When you make a promise and every organization makes a promise of some kind and you deliver against the promise, then you have integrity. That is what integrity is. Integrity is you promise X and you deliver X. Now, that's not always that simple because there's the issues of, de of defining things. But the reality is that when we make decisions that seek to um, almost pretend that we can hide certain stuff, so we give the appearance, we always want to be seen to be trustworthy. I mean, that's the, that's the reality. We want to be the good guys. Everyone, we want to say this is the company that is just doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then we've got some stuff happening in the background. The reality is that, and that's that Chernobyl quote we put in the, in the front, is that stuff will come out. Okay. You know, the, another quote from Chernobyl is every, every, lies, every, every lie we tell um, is a debt to the truth. That someday is going to be repaid. It's just a fantastic quote. And I think that's the point that we're trying to say. Is if we put trust in the forefront of our decision making, then, then the reality is we should be, not guaranteed, we should be in a better place to say, you know what? We can't cut corners here. If there's something in the room we have to deal with, we've got to deal with it. Because otherwise, it's going to come back. And when it comes back, the, the, the damage that that causes, and that's really why this is, sits into the issue of not so much ethics, but managing of risk. Because managing trust is managing risk. Because if I remain trustworthy, I have a lower risk profile. It's as simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Jonah and Vicky, um, Eugene has asked a question. Um, What's, what would some controls be that could be implemented to ensure that trust-based culture is fostered? Trust is not something that you control. I, I, I couldn't say to you, Eugene, you have to be trustworthy. I, I can't say that to you. You have to, you have to demonstrate, frankly, to me that you're trustworthy. I can't put a control in that place. It's a question of as you've mentioned in there, as I won't read the whole question, that really it starts with the tone from the top. Uh, and as the, the governing body, if, there's, if it's visible, they behave in a trustworthy way with all the things that Jonathan's just said, then that will tend to embed through the organization top down. And there's also, we do a trust workshop which starts with, with, uh, from the bottom up. So there is guidance as to what this means but they can't be controls, frankly. I don't see how you control that. And maybe Jonathan wants to add that, but I can just, uh, Bernice has asked a question about what do we mean by fairness? I'll just use an example of what I've been wrestling with, and Jonathan knows this. I've been having a problem at my home with, uh, with my swimming pool. And the guys came along uh, and I, they'd been recommended to me and they said, this is what we do. And that will solve your problem. Well, they came along and did it, and it didn't s s solve the problem. So I phoned them a couple of days later once I tested it, and I found that actually nothing, that there was no solution to this extensive work they'd done. And the chief executive phoned me back, and he said, we'll stand by what we promised, and we will carry on fixing that until such time as you are satisfied. In other words, we're going to treat you fairly against our promise and we will deliver that. Now, he said also, I appreciate that this is inconvenient for you, but nevertheless, we will treat you fairly and do all we can to live up to our promise so that trust is, he didn't say this, so that trust is retained, but effectively that's what it is. So let me just go back to that point. I want to talk about fairness. It's a great question, the question of fairness. Yeah. It is the question, by the way. And I'm glad it was picked up. But just to the bottom line, bottom line is just if the, the, the concept of making clear promises and delivering on them starts at the top. Okay. 
It just starts at the top and goes down. Because if there's a little bit of nudge and a wink and, a, and, 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 and people are promising things and they're not being delivered, we're promising ourselves and we're not delivering, we're promising our customer and we're not delivering, there's always a shortcut because, you know what, that will perv- it'll be said, well, that's how, that's how, look at it this way. You can have whatever values you like on the wall, okay? What people actually do will be the culture of the organization. So you can say we're trustworthy, but if you, but what you are, you know, will be what you are, no matter what you say you are. And so I think the, the this idea of trust, being trustworthy, it starts at the top where management and senior management are, are trustworthy to themselves, trustworthy to the promises they make, trustworthy to the organization, trustworthy to the company, and they actually are. And if they are, then it becomes the culture because that's how we are. And when people see are, are surrounded by people that are, are trustworthy, um, well, then they become trustworthy and the thing kind of builds from there. If it just becomes about us, well, you know, there are all sorts of ways to break it down. So I think, it, as, as Barry said, it's got to start with the leadership. Now, fairness is another thing. Fairness is very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a universal thing. Now, fairness is not, there's not exactly one thing that is fair. In, a, in any organization, you say, well, what is fair? Well, it may be a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The issue of fairness in every culture will be different, but in every culture, there is fairness. There's always something that says, yeah, that, okay, what you did was fair, or what you did was not fair. And that is the ultimate moral appeal that we have, is where I, where I engage with you, I make you a promise. I don't deliver. You, 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 you don't like it. You're upset with me because I haven't delivered. I come back to you and I say, well, you know what? These are my actual circumstances. And then you look at me and say, well, I think you're lying. You're a schmuck. Or you might say, you know what? Okay, I get it. That's fair. And so trust can continue. So fairness is that behavior that, that, that deals with the fact that, well, life is life. And things are hard and things are complex. And did you just actually look after me in the way that is reasonable? Um, or did you take advantage of me? And that's where fairness lies. And no matter where you are in the world, no matter what culture in you, you are in the world, while the exact micro of it maybe differ, there's always an appeal to what is fair. Uh, thanks, John. Um... Philip asks, you know, how do you address a situation where mistrust exists? Well, from my point of view, where there's mistrust, to me, that's a deviant behavior in terms of the way I want to be in my business. If it was my business and uh, I had either co-directors or staff uh, behaving in a way that there was mistrust, obviously that individual would need to go. But I, I can, by my behavior, start building trust so uh, each case has to be looked at in its own merits um, Rafael, we, uh, I haven't seen the scorecard no we haven't shown the scorecard um, is it more like King 4 or can it be customized per organization especially for SMEs and the answer to that is yes one book if a client or a company comes to us and says we want to use the cat and nose solutions uh, we would first of all want to contextualize that business as to how it would be best approached. So yes, you would kiss, you use the phrase customized, contextualized to, the, to that organization. Um, uh, Cezani, you, you um, where are we at? The framework can assist management as well as ensuring all information is needed is incorporated into the pack for proper decision-making. Um, yeah, that's, you know, at the moment, you, you hopefully you get, you get a, a recommendation to the board to approve. Um, this gives the non-executive certainly a, a tool to use to help them in terms of how they're going to interrogate this question. Maybe interrogate sounds too hard, but that's what you need to do. So it needs to be incorporated into the board pack. The Katana um, decision scorecard would be with its supporting documents would be part of the board pack. In fact, it would probably make up a lot of the board pack, particularly in the meaningful decision areas. Um, uh, Vicky, I'm just quietly reading now. There's another one. I don't know, Jonathan, if you're getting the questions coming up. 
uh, Ludmilla. Uh, uh, I'm relying on you, Barry. You're, you're managing it well. It's fine. You think so? Yeah. If yeah, yeah. an organization <laughs> is not, not exactly Catano in principle, but more tending to silo, uh, okay, silo thinking. Yeah, I understand this. And the trouble, when we look at in the definition of integrated reporting and integrated thinking, businesses are interconnected and interrelated. They may have different silos, and that might be product, service, or whatever di driven. Um, and because there may be different circumstances surrounding an individual business, but it's not helpful for the silo thinking that ignores uh, the part of the whole. Um, we've been asked to, to work uh, and consider we're a major business with subsidiaries and so on um, needs to apply. Well, obviously we would, when I say obviously, Catano would be taken into each business so that, that their decision-making processes would be consistent with the Catano principle of trust-based integrated thinking, such that when that is elevated to group level at top governing body level, it's covered. The businesses might be completely different. One might be a service business, the other might be product driven. So it depends on that. But silos, if there's silo thinking, that would be unfortunate if there's not a sense of this is how we behave in each of those silos. Um, Eugene, uh, perhaps by being able to trust the manner in which other members would react to suggestions and critique, we would speak more freely, fostering a culture of transparency and open communication. So in essence, it everybody, it's everybody's uh, responsibility to support a culture of trust. Absolutely. And that means that we have to respect one another. And the way we talk to each other is crucial. Uh, it, there needs to be respect for trust to survive, frankly. And that's, that's just a given. Uh, Eugene, you and I would need to behave towards one another with respect in order for us to continue a trusting relationship. Vicky, I see you've put your, your, your camera on, which is obviously saying to me, it's time for you to shut up. <laughs> not, not at all, Barry, but we have reached 10 o'clock and I do see a lot of our members are commenting that they unfortunately need to leave. Yeah. Um, there's not many uh, questions, I think, left in the, the Q&A and most of them have been around um, trust and, and building trust. So I, think you've, I think you've covered the point um, right. well enough. Um, I, th I think the, maybe the one main question on here that is potentially different from the others and, and is more for a direct question was around how do I build trust in, a, in, a, in an organization where employees have lost trust in management? due to disconnect between shareholders and the management, you know, how do you bridge the gap? But I think you have covered that to some degree, Barry, but I don't know if you have I any think more so. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's, it's a process, yeah. It is. Yeah. So B Barry and Jonathan, I think that brings us to an end to this morning session. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I can see from the comments that the attendees found it very informative and, and a great discussion. So, so much for sharing this. Your details are on the screen. We will share the slides and the recording to everyone that attended via email. Um, and you'll also then be able to get the contact details for Barry and Jonathan if you'd like to get in, in touch with them and discuss more about um, the scorecard that they've developed. Um, and we'll also have both the slides and the webinar recording on our website and YouTube channel. So it will be freely available to all. So you're more than right. welcome. Thank you very much. Find that there. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Oh, and Vicky, if I may, I just want to express my appreciation to University of Stellenbosch's Business School, who connected with uh, Shermer and yourselves, and the outcome was today. So thank you to them. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jonathan. To everyone else, we will see thank you, you everyone. All, um, next week. We've got two more sessions. Uh, well, no, actually, I think next week is our last session of our Boardroom Bites at 9. We'll be taking a break for December, and we'll start again in the new year. So enjoy right. the rest of the week, everyone. Bye all for the now. All the best of the season. Bye-bye.